open our ears, open our eyes, soften our hearts to the word of God. Lord, we love you. We want to see you. You are our Messiah, our master, our risen king. We are your disciples. 2,000 years separates us, but we're as much yours as, as, as Matthew, as Peter, as John. We will follow you in our generation. Fill us and strengthen us now with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, we're going to John chapter 16. <clears throat> if you're new at all, we go through the, the Bible as slowly as I can. <laughs> so this is, I'm, I'm almost, I may be at or I'm almost at about 100 sermons through the Gospel of John. Um, yeah. And there's, I missed a whole bunch of good stuff, you know, on the way. But what I'm doing is, is preaching through it because I'm tired of, of going, passing all of these passages I don't understand. And to, today's passage is no exception. What I'm going to read to you today, I, I looked at it and I thought, well, I see some, some good stuff there. But there's a whole bunch of stuff I don't even know why it's there. And, uh, and, I, and I'm going through this. And then as I begin to study and, and wait on the Holy Spirit and he opens it up, this has become a passage to me that I, it's changed my life. It's, and the word of God is like that. Just remember that. If you don't understand it, it's, 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 it's just because you don't understand it yet. But when he does show it to you, there's life in the entire book. There's life in the entire book. Don't ever discredit it. Don't ever say, well, psh. it's No, the issue is the, you and I are trying to understand a culture that's 2,000, 4,000 years old. We are trying to deal, deal with an, a, another language, with a whole, all kinds of things. But once the Lord opens those things, once the Lord sort of shows us what it really means, wow, it's full of life. And, and I think you'll see that today. All right, I'm going to start at verse 12, going down to verse 21. I'll remind you where we are. These, these chapters, chapters 13 through 17 of, of the Gospel of John, are all set in, on the final evening before Jesus is arrested. And by the time we're at where we are in chapter 16, he's actually left the upper room, gone out somewhere out under the moonlight. It's a, it's a Passover. Uh, so we've got a full moon. He's somewhere east of, of Jerusalem or moving to the east side of Jerusalem, going to cross the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives on the, on the, on the other side. But he stops somewhere along the line, where, and he's been teaching the eleven. Judas Iscariot's gone. He's, he's over with the, uh, with the temple authorities, getting the religious police, and they're coming to arrest Jesus. They're trying to find him right about now. They probably have already gone to the upper room, and he's not there. And so they're, they're marching around looking, and he's somewhere. He's out, in a, uh, out probably in a vineyard there somewhere from, from the way he preaches. And he's, he's teaching them, and he's, he's preparing them for his departure. He's been just pouring into them, talking especially about the coming of the Holy Spirit. He said, everything's going to change now. When, I, when I've done what I do, I, I've been called to do, this Holy Spirit's going to come to you in a whole new level, and you're going to walk in this new power. So he's preparing them for this, but they do not understand him. They don't know what he's saying. So let's, let's hear what he says he's just told them about what the, the Holy Spirit through them will convict the world of, of uh, sin, righteousness, and judgment, if you recall. And then he says, verse 12, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Would you read that verse out loud? I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Say all the truth. That's important. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. Then, he's, then he makes what is really quite a, a simple, straightforward statement, but it causes all sorts of confusion. He says, a little while and you will no longer see me, and a little while and you will see me. Some of his disciples uh, said to one another, what is this thing he's telling us? A little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me. And because I go to the Father. So they were saying, what is this that he says a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. This is honestly embarrassing. 
the whole thing is, and I'll talk about it more in a minute. Jesus knew that they wished to question him, and he, and he said to them, are you deliberating together about this? That I said a, a little while, and you, will, and, and you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the wor world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned to joy. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. Uh, all right, let's, let's look at the discussion guide. The teacher within. There are spiritual truths that you cannot understand no matter how smart you are until God reveals them to you. Did you hear that? Once you finally understand the meaning, something, pardon me, they understand the meaning seems so obvious, you find it hard to believe that you never saw it before. Think, to, think of yourself. Have you had things, that maybe passages you read in the Bible, that you didn't understand, maybe didn't even like? I mean, some, some are offensive, aren't they? If you've read it, you've, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't know what I'm talking about, let's read the Bible. But if, if, you've, if you've read it, you've come across stuff going, that shouldn't be there. It just shouldn't be in my Bible, right? So there's things you don't understand. There's things that you, that all of this, and then somewhere along the line, the, whole, the Lord has shown you, he's opened your understanding, and you suddenly see, aha, is that what that means? And it becomes a hallmark for you. I mean, you, 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 you quote it, you memorize it, you love it, you stand on it, because all of a sudden it has life. Yes? How many would say, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes, that is the, that's revelation. That's revelation. When something I don't understand, it doesn't mean people don't, the, the point that Jesus is making here is that people don't not understand spiritual truth because they're, they're, because they're dumb. It's because it hasn't been revealed to them. Spiritual truth must be revealed. Say that. Spiritual truth must be revealed. Amen. All right. But the fact is, until God explained it to you, it never made sense. This is what Jesus was explaining to his disciples that evening when he said to them, I still have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. In other words, he told them, you don't have the spiritual capacity yet to comprehend what I want to teach you. No matter how carefully Jesus might try to explain those things, he would only confuse them. But the next statement he made was a promise that the obstruction that prevented them from understanding spiritual truth would be removed when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. You say, oh, there you go. You're a Pentecostal. You always bring that in. <laughs> I try. <laughs> Look, was the Holy Spirit present that evening? We had a discussion as we talked about the plan last week. And we said, was, was, was the Spirit of God powerfully at work in the Old Testament? Yes. And, did we, and we, I said, name some people. And you just named about two dozen. So we, we talked about miracles. There were people raised from the dead in the Old Testament. That, that takes power, right? Yeah. yeah. So is the Holy Spirit present in the Old Testament? Absolutely. Absolutely. But Jesus says, the Spirit... But when the spirit of truth comes, and he hasn't come yet the way he's going to come. Do you follow that? Something has not yet happened that's going to happen. And when it does, he will be in you, and you're going to understand. You, see, you follow that? He's talking about what? what? What day is he talking about? Pentecost. Absolutely talking about Pentecost. No question about what he's pointing to. All through his ministry, it's not, this, isn't, this is an isolated occasion. All through his ministry, he kept saying, boy, when the Spirit comes, when the Spirit comes. But the Spirit's there, but not the way he's going to be. You follow this? There is a baptism of the Holy Spirit. There is a difference. He, his death and resurrection has made a new possibility, a new potential. Will come because of what he's doing. When that promise arrived, which Jesus' death and resurrection would make possible, the Spirit would dwell inside them and empower their minds to comprehend spiritual truth. In the future, they would always have a teacher to guide their learning until they understood God and his ways with no deception or distortion. Then, as if to prove his point about their inability to understand... Jesus made a simple statement which, given all that he had said in the past, should have been easily understood. He said, a little while and you will no longer behold me. 
and again a little while and you will see me. In other words, I'm going to die, but don't worry. I'll be dead for a short time, only a short time, and then I'll come back to life and you'll see me again. That isn't, that isn't complex, is it? I'll be gone a little while, but I'll be back. He's been talking to them all through the, the, his, his ministry time with them, saying, I, in fact, he told them how long that little while would be. He said, they, I'll, I'll die and I'll be dead how many days? Yeah, he's told them how many days. And then he says, I'll be back. And he said it repeatedly through his ministry. So here this night, he says, I'll be gone a little while, but I'll be back. And they're going, what on earth did he mean by that? <laughs> and and it, it's, it's, it's awkward. Like, what do you mean you don't understand? He summarized in one sentence a truth he had been trying to teach them for the past two and a half years. But his words left them so confused, they conducted a discussion among themselves and decided that they had no idea what he meant, and not even Peter had the courage to ask for further clarity. That's exceptional. <laughs> Frankly, their ignorance is odd and a bit unsettling. You almost wish John hadn't mentioned it, because we don't understand why they didn't understand but if we think back to what Jesus said moments earlier, we discover a very important insight about how humans learn about God. We discover that spiritual truths appear to be foolish to the unenlightened mind. We discover that understanding spiritual truth requires a miracle. And thankfully, it's a miracle God wants to give us. Would you turn that over to your daily Bible study? I'm going to just take a few days. I'm taking you back to the text. And I just by way of explanation or apology. Look, I, 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 un, I, I push you as hard as I can. I'll be honest with you. I, I'm trying to get as much understanding of the scripture in you that, that I, before you walk out on me. And, and so I gauge that. When they start walking, I stop. Uh, but I'm pressing it in. So what I'm doing is I'm taking you back and I want to look at some of that text. And I want, why? Because next time you read it, I want you to understand it. Next time you open that passage and read it, I want you to go, yes, and see it. You understand? For yourself. And then what happens is the Spirit of God will start talking to you. And he'll start speaking to you from it. He'll start bringing life to you from it. That's what I want for you. That's why I'm doing this. All right. I'm going to just do Sunday, Monday, and Wednesday. Jesus was also, pardon me, Jesus was almost finished preparing his disciples for his departure. He would soon lead them across the Kidron Valley to a small garden on the Mount of Olives where he would wait for Judas to arrive with soldiers to betray him. He'd used every available moment of his final hours with those men to raise their expectations for the blessings that his cross and resurrection would bring. But now as the time to leave drew near, he became deeply aware of how much spiritual truth those men still needed to learn if they were to properly teach his church how to walk with God. Who are those 11 men? They're the apostles. These are the men who are going to go out and then teach the world how to believe in Jesus. And, and think of what they don't know. They, they, don't, they don't know. They really don't know anything about the life of the Spirit. They don't know about the gifts of the Spirit. They don't know how to pray with authority. They can't even figure out that he's going to be gone three days and come back. I mean, we're back here. And then there's so much they must know. But they don't know yet. But he says they will. And so he said to them, I still have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. When he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak from himself. That's what it says. He will not speak from himself, but he will speak what things he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are coming. Monday, there were many spiritual truths he had not taught them because they had not been baptized with the Holy Spirit. Until they had the Holy Spirit dwelling within them, revealing those truths to their understanding and providing the gifts and power they would need to put them into practice, there was no point in teaching them about the things, about things they were incapable of obeying. They can't, they don't know how to move in, in any of that, the prophetic word or praying for the sick. They've been watching him and he sent them out to do some stuff, but it's still not computing. But Jesus assured them that in the future, they would learn those things because the Holy Spirit would guide them into all truth. Wednesday, though he was going to physically leave them, Jesus wanted his disciples to know that in the future, he would continue to be their teacher. Then he explained how he would do that. He said, he, 
and I have that person will glorify me because he will receive that which comes from me and he will declare those things to you. He will not speak from himself. He'll take what he hears me speak and he will speak it to you. Did you follow that? I put that, that, that person in there. I want to just a little bit of an aside for a second. There's times people say, how do we know that the Holy Spirit is a person? How do we know it's not just the Father's Spirit coming? How, how do we know it's not, it's not sort of an it, an, an influence or a, or a source? And there, you, you can look at passages in the Old Testament or, or, or other places, and you say it's not absolutely clear. In these chapters, 13 through 70 of, of, of John, that night is when Jesus taught it in indisputable terms that the Holy Spirit is a person of God. And this is one of the passages. Let me just give you a little bit. Here he says, he says, when he comes, now, and, and there is a, there, uh, or that one, it's a, it's a demonstrative pronoun, bear with me. And that demonstrative pronoun can either be masculine, feminine, or neuter, depending on who you're talking about. The word, the word spirit is neuter. And some people jump on that and say, ah, see, it's neuter. But all of the verbs, the word in Greek is pneuma. Ma. Well, all the ma verbs are neuter. So you can't look at that. It doesn't mean anything. It's just that's the kind of way they are. But here is an example. Jesus says, he says, when the spirit comes, then he says, and he picks not the neuter form, but he picks the masculine. And he says, when he, that one comes. And he, and he deliberately chooses the masculine. We know it's a person. Did you follow what I said? Yeah. And this happens numerous times in there. He says, he says, and he, he says the, the, the father will send to, us, to you, he says, another comforter. And he uses a word, uh, alos, which means another of the same kind. He could have used heteros, he, another of a different kind. But he didn't. He says he will. So it's not the father who comes. He says the father will send a, another comforter. Do you follow me? This is important to get straight for a second. He sent another comforter. And he, this person, will be with you. And he will dwell in you. That's how we know. And it's numerous times through this section of John. This is where it is. All right. Where did I launch from? You know, Okay. Am I at verse 15 there? Would that be good? So, then so there would be no confusion in their minds. He clarified a statement that he had just made. He said that the Holy Spirit would declare to them that which comes from me. Would you say that? That which I'll show you later. That's really important. But he did not want them to conclude from that statement that he himself was ultimately the source of those spiritual truths. Because the source of all things is God the Father. So he added these words, all things which the Father has are mine. For that reason, I said that he, the Holy Spirit, receives that which comes from me and will declare those things to you. Let's turn that back over. Spiritual revelation. Paul captured this insight that spiritual truth is foolish to the unenlightened human mind. In a letter he wrote to the church in Corinth, he said, would you read it out loud with me? Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we speak not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit. Do you see that? We now have the spirit who is from God that we may know the things freely given to us by God. He went on to say, read this out loud with me. But a natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him. For he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. And the word is discerned. This is why you can't argue people into faith. You can even win the argument. All they'll do is hate your guts. <laughs> they'll go away angry, but not convinced. Because they don't see it. It's foolish to them. You cannot argue people into faith. Well, what do you do then? You must pray. 
This is why the, the, all evangelism, says, says one person, all evangelism is the harvest of prayer. You pray. When you pray for someone, the Holy Spirit begins to work with that person. You have that authority. You have that right in the name of Jesus. It's just, Lord, I, I begin to pray for that person. I, 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 in the authority of Jesus, I stop the powers of, of, of the enemy to confuse or deceive or lie to this person. I ask you to, re Lord, remove that power off of them. And may your spirit open their ears, open their eyes, soften their hearts. You begin to intercede for someone, and then the spirit begins to show them. And he's already told us the three things the Holy Spirit will show them to an unbeliever. He will convict them of sin, that they don't believe in Jesus. Convict them of righteousness, Jesus' righteousness, that he was truly resurrected from the dead and raised to the right hand of the Father. And that he has, he has judged the ruler of this world, that the devil and his power is broken by Jesus' cross. You follow that? This is what the Spirit will tell them. This is what he will talk to them about when you begin to intercede. You don't argue someone in because they can't see it. You pray them until they are, until the Spirit reveals Christ to them. You understand? All right. We might assume when we hear those words that Paul was comparing saved and unsaved people. But I think his meaning is deeper than that. He's comparing our natural human mind with the mind that has been enlightened by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. He went on to declare, we have the mind of Christ. So as we watch those 11 men struggle to understand something that has become so familiar to us today, we need to remember the root of their problem. It wasn't that they lacked intellectual capacity. It was that they lacked spiritual revelation. They were listening only to their natural minds, not the mind of the spirit. They didn't have the inner teacher to help them. All we need to do is compare those confused men with the bold, crystal clear declaration of the death and resurrection of the Messiah, which Peter preached to the gathered crowd on Pentecost to see the difference. If you have a Bible, turn with me to, to Acts chapter 2. I just want you to see the difference. Here's Peter. Not even Peter has the guts to say, oh, I don't know what he means, you know. Uh, he'll rise, you know, be gone a little while and be back a little while. Boy, that's too puzzling for me. So we're in that condition. And then 50 days later, 50 days later, listen to Peter. Something's really changed in the, in the, in the difference. I'll start at verse 22. You've, got, you've had Pentecost. You've had this great outpouring of the Spirit and all these different languages. The people gather by the thousands. Uh, Peter, Peter begins to preach to them. And he said, this is, this is the fulfillment of what the prophet Joel said, that I will pour out my spirit on, on all flesh in the last days, says the Lord, on your young, young, young men and your, your women and your men will prophesy and old men and all of that. And then he says, it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And now he's going to explain the name of the Lord. Let's just listen to Peter. This is the new Peter, Peter with the spirit within him. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you with, by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in, the, in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. We talked about the plan last week, remember? No? Yes, thank, just a yes or two would help. You nailed to a, to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. And then he quotes from the Psalms where David says, your holy one, the one who's pure, truly holy, death will not be able to hold. The grave can't hold it. And then he goes on to say, but David wasn't that holy one. He is, we've got his grave right over here. <laughs> you know, he, he died. He's not the holy one. And so verse 30 because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath that one of it, he would seat one of his descendants on the throne. That's, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, the Messiah, and he, that he neither abandoned, was be abandoned to Hades, nor his flesh 
suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses and having exalted to the right hand of God and received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. I'll stop. How's that for a difference? Peter before, Peter after. Now, in the, in, in, the, in the period of that 50 days, Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, has met with them, and he has taught them, Luke tells us this, he taught them from the Psalms, he taught them from the prophets, and he taught them from the law, the, the books of Moses. So he, they've had him teach, the resurrected Lord has taught them. But still, they're still kind of in an upper room huddled, just waiting in prayer, waiting in prayer. And then when the power of the Holy Spirit comes on them, these these Men rise up with a totally different demeanor. They're bold. They get it. They're eloquent. This is the Holy Spirit. It's not them. And it's the same spirit given to you. You follow me? This boldness, this clarity, this understanding, this passion, it's part, it's part of the anointing. It's what he comes to give, to turn us into living, living witnesses of Jesus Christ. Two minds. When the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside a person, in fact, you might turn with me to, if, if you want to Romans 8, uh, uh, just so you have it in front of you. I'm looking at five, verses 5 and 6. When, a, when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside a person, God doesn't take out their natural mind and replace it with the mind of Christ. He places the Holy Spirit within that person, and the Spirit has a mind of his own. In effect, he brings into that person a second mind. Are you with me here? When you receive the Lord, when, you receive the, when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you, he does not take and remove your natural mind and put a new one in its place. You still have the natural mind. You may have noticed but you have dwelling in you the Holy Spirit himself, and he has a mind. Yeah. Well, I'll show, yes, it is the mind of Christ. It, in effect, he brings into that person a second mind. The person now has two minds, a natural mind, which produces thoughts by the functioning of the brain, and a spiritual mind, which he or she accesses by listening to the Holy Spirit. That means we have a choice day by day and even moment by moment to choose to stop listening to our physically generated thoughts and start listening to the thoughts generated by the Holy Spirit. And the difference between the two sources is huge. Paul says, for the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the spirit is life and peace. Now, your Bible probably says there the mind set on. Mine does. The mind set on the, on the flesh or the mind set on the spirit. It, there's no set on in there at all. That is an interpolation by the translators trying to make sense of it. It simply says the mind of the flesh is, is death. The mind of the spirit is life and peace. And I, and they, and they, I think they've missed it. There are two minds. There are two minds. Your, your flesh mind. I, I, it takes me no effort at all uh, to be in the flesh. Uh, it, I, I wake up in the morning. Did today. That's why I took communion. Uh, did, and I can think of all the things that are, are worrying me, that hurt me, uh, that are, you know, I, the, the mind, that's, my, that's my, my natural mind. There it goes, thinking about that stuff. But I can choose to stop listening to it and to turn my mind to the Lord. That's, I, 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 I get up in the morning, I start reading the word, I have a time. I'm, I'm, I'm changing brains. I understand this truth, and you must understand this truth. This is really the demarcation between maturity and immaturity in the walk with God. You learn to recognize the difference. You learn to go, man, I'm thinking with the flesh mind. <laughs> this is the old thinking. Stop, turn, think, listen to the spirit. When we worship this morning, I, we often come, we're weary. We, we, we have those kinds of things. We've, had a, we've, we've got all of these things on our minds. 
But you'll notice that the songs, we start out with strong declarative songs. That, you can blame that on me. I mean, I didn't pick those songs, but I, I, I did review the list. Uh, but I didn't pick that song, but here's what I tell them. I want you to get us standing in front of the Lord, and I want you to get us declaring out of our mouth faith and, and strength. Whether, because that's how you get out of that lethargic, sad, heavy feeling. You, you speak the truth. You focus on the truth. So there you are talking about, you know, I'll stand with arms. And, 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 you, and you, what you're doing is you're shifting from one mind to the next. And all of a sudden you go, yeah, I'm a child of God. Right? You're, that's not foolishness. This isn't, this isn't, this isn't self-suggestion. You have declared the truth. See, here, here, hypocrisy is when you say something you don't believe. That's hypocritical. But maturity is when you say something you don't feel, but you believe. Did you follow that? So it, what you learn to do is declare the truth in spite of what the, you're feeling and what the old mind is thinking. You, you, you go, okay, this is the flesh. I'm coming out of it. I am going to focus on the truth. And you begin to declare the truth, who, who we are. And as you stand in that, you find that your spirit rises up. And you change and you're transformed. This is a pattern that will be part of your life the rest of your life. There, don't, well, I won't, don't let somebody tell you, no, when you become a Christian, everything becomes new. Well, then I'm apparently not a Christian. And I bet most of us would have to go, me, me neither. Because don't you still fight with the old? Yeah. All right, the Bible does not promise that that'll go. It, it says someday it will. You know when? You get a resurrection body. When your body's resurrected, it's called a spiritual body. Meaning not that you can see through it, but that it's, it is now submitted to the spirit. It no longer has the flesh in it, in that sense. This old nature is gone. The day will come we'll, when, we, when we're resurrected in, the, in that, that state. We will have bodies that do not fight us, that do not have that kind of garbage in them at all. We'll be at peace. Won't that be lovely? But between now and then, we are still in, 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 in bodies with this old thing. So when you've been scarred and wounded in your subconscious, issues have gone on in your childhood, it's still there. It's in the old mind. But you have access to the mind of the spirit who dwells within you and never leaves you. So you can turn to his mind and listen to him and let him feed you and build you up and remind you of Christ any time you choose. No matter what the situation is, you can turn to him and the truth, as was said earlier, the truth will raise you up and make you strong. Am I at departing from the truth? I'm sorry. I can't, I can't, where am I? Not quite, huh? Oh, okay. There we are. One leads us to do, the one mind leads us to do and think things that produce, this produce spiritual or even physical death. And the other leads us to do and think things that produce spiritual or even physical life and peace. You can just see the fruit of it. If you keep letting your, your flesh mind go, you'll spiral downward. You'll get angrier and angrier. More and more hateful, more and more fearful, more and more judgmental. You'll just feel it suck you down. It goes there if you let it. If you focus, if you start, if you start looking at the mind of the spirit and you begin to look at the word of God, you begin to worship the Lord, you begin to declare the truth, you'll find yourself spiraling the other way. Up you go, stronger, stronger, more and more peaceful. You can think clear, clear again. Paul is teaching us that a believer who has the spirit of truth within has a choice. We can listen to either voice. But if we choose to listen to the Spirit's voice, he will lead us into life and peace, or as Jesus said, all truth. Departing from the truth. Yet we have all met believers who were led into deception. For that matter, all of us have likely been deceived or confused at times, which makes us ask the question, how is that possible if the Spirit of truth dwells within someone? How can a person be deceived or confused? Here is a list of several ways a believer can depart from truth. Number one, false teachers. 
There are people who are good at persuading others, even when what they believe is wrong. They can place in front of us logical arguments that make sense, quote, but aren't revealed truth. There are things that make sense, but they aren't true. Logic does not lead to spiritual truth necessarily at all. And so there will be people who say, well, see this and see this and see this. And it will appeal to your logical mind. You go, well, that makes sense. But God's ways aren't our ways. Look at people. We're talking about the one who simply said, let there be. And you have this explosion of a universe which is so big we can't even conceive it. Do you understand? You've been watching any of this stuff on, they, they, they just crash landed this Cassini, uh, uh, what do you call that, a, a satellite onto Saturn. But it's been taking pictures, you know, and all of this. So you see these things of the universe. Have you seen any of those? It's just like, oh my goodness. It's just huge. And we just talk about trillions of stars. The person who said, Let's have a universe. Boom. You figure you're going to understand him perfectly, do you? <laughs> you figure he's maybe just a bit bigger than we are, just a bit smarter than we are. Has, has any, I mean, just, you just got to put it in perspective for a minute. and go, wait a minute. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about the creator of heaven and earth here. I'm talking about the Lord. So uh, there's going to be things I just don't understand. And if we're not careful, we can be led down a line of reasoning that convinces us of something that sounds good, but isn't true. False teachers also employ truths that flatter us or employ, promise to fulfill our lusts or greed or desire to dominate others. Beware when people begin to flatter you. You know, the Lord's just showing me he's called you to some, some great, great, great ministry. You are going to be a prophet to the nations. You are, going to be the, you are going to be an apostle sent out. God says he's, you know, thousands will be at your feet. When they start talking to you like that way, just back up. Just back up. Be careful. They appeal to the flesh or they tell you, look, if you believe what I, you start believing what I'm telling you, you're going to get so rich, so rich. Yeah. You know, you know. They're hooking you. They're putting a hook in your flesh. This is, this is marketing. This is raw marketing and it's done all the time. And it's done by prophecy often and those kinds of things, supposed. So just be really careful. Number two, mental pride. This is a very subtle danger, but a path that leads many into deception. It happens when a person decides to believe only what makes sense to them. The problem is God's thoughts are bigger and different than our thoughts. So there are biblical truths I must accept even though I don't understand them yet. I had a fellow come by uh, Oh, I was probably a year ago. I don't, maybe longer. I, time goes by and I just can't keep track of it. But I, I was, there was another meeting. It wasn't a weekend. And uh, it was a service. And he came and waited for me afterwards. And, and he began, came right over afterwards uh, and started talking to me. He caught me a little off guard. It was a, uh, it wasn't, it was a, a, a memorial service. And he began to talk to me. And as I listened to him, trying to argue about the nature of God, I, 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 I turned and asked him, I said, are you oneness? And what that is, is uh, oneness has, has been heavily taught around here in the past. And it, the, it makes sense. It, see, it's, it's, a, it's a human attempt to, to, to straighten out a mystery. And so the mystery is that there is a father, he's begotten a son, and there's the Holy Spirit, and... But God is one, and how do we do that? And, and so we figure it out. And what we say is, well, there's really just one person. He just does three different jobs. You know, he's, and now he's the son, and now he's the father, and now he's the Holy Spirit, just one guy doing three things. It's just labeling. And it's, it's a deep heresy. And I said, are you oneness? And he says, no, I'm, I'm Tunis. <laughs> now, I even know how you get there. And, and, and it's, uh, it's partly why I just talked about the Holy Spirit. And, I, and, I, and, and I, I wish I had been nicer. I'm, I kind of regret the way I responded to him. I snapped. And, and, I, 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 and, I, and I said, you don't know that. I said, that's your, that's your own mind working. 
You have no, no, I have no scripture for that. And I just popped him. And I'm sorry for it. I didn't mean to do it like that. But look, here's the deal. If you say, I will not understand, I will not believe something till it makes sense to me, you are going to become crazy. You are going to be false. I promise you that. Because there are things that are in the Bible teaches clearly, but it does not explain all of the mechanics. It doesn't give you all the logistics. It doesn't tell you how everything fits and works. And it doesn't answer all your questions. And if I, am, if I have decided I will only believe what I understand, you'll believe that much and you will be led into deception. Promise. There's a deep humility in the heart of an orthodox believer, a person who is staying within the Bible that says, if the Bible says it, and that's what it means, I believe that. And I don't understand everything. But then you have, you have as you walk with the Lord, because the Bible says he wants you to understand all truth. He actually wants us to know you are a son or a daughter of the living God. And he is in the process of preparing you for eternal ministry and leadership with him. That's what the Bible says. And so he wants you to understand all things. But there's a process of how we learn. And so you end up with a, you need to have a to, to be answered later file. And you have these questions. You go, what about that? And you go, I, I don't know. You stick it in your to an, be answered later file. And you say, Lord, when you can show me that, would you? I'd like to know. And you'll be surprised that as life goes on, things will happen. And all of a sudden, something you never understood just opens up to you. Something happens. You read something somewhere. You go, there it is. That's it. And you, you find something in the word. You know, and it's, and it's beautiful to you. And now the thing that what used to be mysterious and confusing becomes beautiful to you and deep and wonderful. He will teach you. You have the teacher within. You follow? The teacher within you. All right, I'll move quickly. I, I mean that when I say it. Lack of integrity. I'm, I'm not trying to lie to you, but I, I'm, I'm trying to move. All of us encounter truth we don't like. Some even offends us. It demands change or points out something we didn't want to see. And that's when a person's integrity or lack of it will govern what they choose to believe. Some will submit to God, but others will look for ways to make God's word say something it doesn't say. Some will even declare that, they, that God told them that they didn't have to obey him in this matter. Now, you laugh, but you'll hear it. God says he's okay with this. You know, I know what it says, but God spoke to me, and he told me it was okay. No matter how a person tries to explain their disobedience... It stems from a flaw in their character. They're willing to revise biblical truth or pretend that God said something he didn't say. Let me, let me be clear with you. God will never speak to you prophetically and tell you something that clearly violates his word. If you think you heard it, you're wrong. And integrity, this is where integrity, integrity is everything in this business, people. I mean, it's, it, when you move in the spirit, it, there has to be this honest humility that's willing to be wrong, willing to be corrected, willing to not be, you know, it's not, I'm not always right. And I have to let, and so, but if I come across passages I don't understand or I don't like, I don't go, well, if I were God, I wouldn't do that. And, and, and start deciding I'm going to change it or fiddle around with the words. I mean, I explain to you Greek and things, but you'll have people use those same techniques to undermine the clear meaning of the scripture. And they try to snow you with a, lot of, with a lot of language and all of this kind of stuff. And they try to say, see, now this is what it really means. And they're deceiving using it. That's why when I, when, I, when I study, when you study, I have to be completely, as much as I'm capable of being, honest to what it says. Is that what it says? And let it cut me if it says. Let it, let it correct me if it says it. Let it, let it change me. You follow this? Yeah. Number four, doubt. There are truths that God reveals to us that can only be received by faith. They are so big, so good, so powerful that without faith in God, we will reject them as nonsense. Faith gives us eyes to look not at the things that are seen, but at the things which are not seen. How the Spirit teaches us. How does the Spirit teach us? How does he guide us into all truth? 
Jesus told his disciples that he would take personal responsibility for their spiritual development. Even after he ascended into heaven, he would continue to teach them, but he would do so by telling the Holy Spirit what he wanted a person to know. And then the Spirit would speak to that person until they understood the truth Jesus desired for them. You following that? Jesus referred to this process as guiding someone into truth. Let's listen to his words again. He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak from himself, but he will speak what things he hears from me, is what Jesus is saying. In other words, the spirit within us will follow the instructions of the head of the church. And based on what our head has decided we need to learn, the spirit will proceed to teach us. In effect, you have a personal life coach. You have a personal trainer. Jesus takes responsibility for your development and your teaching. The Spirit of God has been placed within you. The Spirit of God will speak to you what the Lord, uh, your Lord and Master has told him to speak to you. He is guiding your growth. Isn't that beautiful? There is, there is Jesus is watching over. Jesus is training you. Jesus is growing you up. The Spirit of the Lord has been given to you, but he's listening to him. He speaks what he hears him say to you. He declares him to you. He's constantly bringing us. I'm so grateful. That really put a piece together for me. When I, it, when I saw that in this passage, I said, Jesus, you're teaching me through the Holy Spirit. You're guiding my development. Hallelujah. He does this in many ways. He will use circumstances to confront us or expand our knowledge. He will enlighten us as we, as we meditate in the word, meaning we suddenly know something we didn't know a moment before. He will convict us when we begin to walk in the wrong direction. He does that by grieving or warning our spirit that we have displeased the Lord or placed ourselves in danger. He will give us a spiritual gift of discernment to assure us that we are hearing truth. Or warn us that we are hearing a lie. I mean, you ever been in a situation, you're sitting there listening to something maybe, uh, or you're in, you're, you went to a service and suddenly the spirit within you says, get out of here, you don't belong here, get out now. This is wrong, get out. You, you don't know why you know that, but inside you're just grinding. This is not right, I don't know why, but I'm not, I don't, I, I gotta get out of here. Now, now I'm gonna wait and see if anyone walks out now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry. He will give us a spiritual gift of discernment. Uh, he will show us the source behind something we are hearing or seeing, whether it's from God, the devil, or the flesh. You'll suddenly just know, man, that's coming right out of that person's flesh. That isn't God. Or that's God. He will even speak to us prophetically through trustworthy believers or at times even non-believers. You can have a non-believer say something to you and you go, God, you go, Lord suddenly says, I'm talking to you. You listening? However, he guides us. We can be sure he is guiding us into truth, the truth Jesus wants to teach us. Choosing truth. God can only do so much. If you and I want to understand spiritual truth, we have to learn to listen to the teacher within. That requires of us honesty, humility, a work ethic. You got to be willing to study and look and dig in some of these things. An investment of time. And this is one of our greatest uh, difficulties for all of us. We need to take a Sabbath day. And by that, I don't mean a particular day. But I mean a day where you, you sit with the Lord and listen to him and rest. And you've got to turn off the phone. The Wall Street Journal just had a, an article this week on, on cell, smartphones make us stupid. Said. And... <laughs> and uh, what they, they did is they tested this, and they had people, uh, and they gave them an exam, and they let some put the phone right on the desk in front of them. Some, the next group had, could keep it on their purse or in their pocket, and the third group had to take the phone and leave it outside in another room. The ones who left the phone out in the other room scored way better than the others because we're always waiting for that sucker to ring. Where there's, there's a sense of what's going on that I'm missing. What's going on that I'm missing? You know, you get caught into this. It pulls your brains into it. You have to detach that to listen to the Lord. The thing has to go off. Go get it off. Turn it. Get away from it. If you are gone for three or four hours, 
the world will not fall apart. If it does, what are you going to have done about it anyway? You know? You... It'll, you know, so, so then when you turn it on, you can find out where the world went while you were gone. <laughs> but that phone is one of the things that right now, if you want to get through to the Lord, you got to give him your mind, got to give him your heart, got to open up. But if we choose to let the spirit guide us, he will again, he will begin to, we will begin to think more and more like Jesus. That's the mind of Christ. Many years after John wrote this gospel, his gospel, he wrote a letter to believers in which he explained this very truth that we studied today. Listen, why don't you read it with me? As for you, the anointing which you received from him, Jesus, abides in you, and you have no need for anyone, meaning the false teachers who were troubling them, to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true, and is not a lie. And just as it is taught you, you abide in him. You have an anointing that teaches you. Our teacher will always bring us back to Jesus. Would you stand with me? Blessed be the Lord. Praise you, Jesus. If, if you are w willing to do this, don't feel, you don't, certainly don't have to do it, but would you put your hand on your stomach? Again, if you don't want to do it, just, you can just think about your stomach. <laughs> you know why you're, that's where the Bible says he comes to dwell, within your innermost being. And I, I say that with a, with a boldness now because that's exactly what Ezekiel said. Identical words Jesus quoted when he says, he says, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Rivers, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. The life of God will fill you and there'll be absolutely no lack of that life. You and I are full. We have within us the very Spirit of God. We are living stones, says Peter. Living stones coming to the living stone and then we are joined together as a people into a spiritual house to worship the Lord. Full of God, our teacher dwells within us. Lord, would you open our ears to your voice? Would you open our eyes to see the things you will show us? Lord God, we understand that you have, we have within us the mind of Christ. We have the mind of the Spirit. And we thank you that you are you are giving us the capacity to hear, the, the capacity to see, to walk and learn. You are teaching us all things, for we are children of God. We believe that. We receive that. Come, Holy Spirit. Just be strong and, 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 and mightily at work within us. We ask that in Jesus' name. If that's your prayer, would you say amen? amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.